Brunswick Town State Historic Site. This is on the west side of the Cape Fear River, south of Wilmington, about 15 miles. This is the visitor center for Brunswick Town and Fort Anderson down here south of Wilmington, North Carolina. So let's see what we can learn here. I've never been here. Yeah, just go in that little room and do the And then is the Orton Plantation House, is it viewable? It's not open anymore. No? Billionaire bought it and closed it to the public. Colonial North Carolina. inhabited by Indians for countless generations. Now Europeans were making the same land their home. As settlement and trade increased, the colony grew and prospered, but it was at the expense of the Indians' land and culture. a number of important towns were established along the principal waterways. Among them was the port of Brunswick Town, which accounted for much of the colony's trade in lumber and naval stores, tar, pitch, turpentine, and rosin. Very quickly, the Cape Fear River port became the British Empire's most valuable source of naval stores for maintaining the Royal Navy. Politically, Brunswick Town served as the seat of New Hanover County, and later, Brunswick County. The Colonial Assembly met at the town often. The Royal Governors Arthur Dobbs and William Tryon were residents during most of their administrations. The future of Brunswick seemed promising, but with the outbreak of the American Revolution, all hopes were shattered when the town was burned by an invading British Army. During the years that followed, Brunswick was unable to recover. In 1842, the land that the village occupied was sold for $4.25. The town of Brunswick and much of its history sank into oblivion. But only temporarily. Through historical research and archaeological investigation of the 1950s and 60s, the story of Brunswick was literally uncovered, and a new and exciting chapter was added to the colonial history of the Lower Cape Fear, a history that dates from the first attempted at settlement of the region nearly 60 years before the first Roanoke Island colony. The year was 1526. Lucas Vasquez de Ayoa led an expedition of 500 Spaniards from Santo Domingo in the West Indies to the mouth of the Cape Fear River. As the expedition entered the river, one of the ships was wrecked. Thus the colonists set out to build another ship, perhaps the first by Europeans in North America. But the illness and mutiny forced the colonists to move southward, where they eventually disbanded and returned to the West Indies. In the 1660s, about 140 years after the Spanish had left the area, there were two more attempts to settle the Cape Fear, but these also met with failure. Another half-century elapsed. In 1715, Colonel Maurice Moore, on a military expedition to aid South Carolina, passed through the Lower Cape Fear. He was so impressed with the area that in 1725 he obtained on the river's west bank a grant of 1,500 acres. On 320 acres overlooking the river, Moore laid out the town of Brunswick, in honor of King George I, who was also the of Brunswick. The town had 336 half-acre lots, each 82 and a half feet by 264 feet. Later, Maurice Moore's brother, Roger, who built Wharton Plantation just north of Brunswick, added 20 more lots to the town. In addition to home sites, there were specific lots designated for the construction of a church, courthouse, jail, stocks, and pillory. But a large number of the lots in Brunswick were never sold, and much of the land remained undeveloped. Only two of the sandy streets of Brunswick had names, Front Street and Second Street. Both ran parallel to the river. The connecting streets were sometimes referred to as alleys, cross streets, or upper streets. One of the most interesting structures in Brunswick was a six-room inn or public house. 
The rooms were arranged in a row, similar to the modern motel. In their excavations, the archaeologists found numerous sewing articles in five of the six rooms. This indicated that the public house may have been used as a tailor shop at one time. Since it was customary for the citizens of Brunswick to dispose of refuse in their backyards, the archaeologists found an interesting array of materials behind the public house. Broken dishes, bones, glassware, rum bottles, and other items were found to a depth of three feet. Perhaps the most impressive residence in Brunswick was Russellboro, the home of two royal governors. Begun in the early 1750s by Captain John Russell, this two-story frame house was unfinished when Governor Arthur Dobbs bought it in 1758. Dobbs completed work on the house and lived there until his death in 1765. William Tryon succeeded Dobbs as governor, and he lived at Russellboro until Tryon Palace was completed in New Bern in 1770. The next year, Tryon sold the house to William Dry, collector of customs for Fort Brunswick. Five years later, Russellboro was in ashes, a victim of the British torch. Another impressive residence was the Hepburn Reynolds House, named for two Brunswick merchants, Charles Hepburn and George Reynolds. The house was built sometime between 1734 and 1742 on property shared by the two men. The remains of an outside chimney indicates the house had more than one floor. While excavating the first level, archaeologists found a charred wooden floor in what was apparently the kitchen. A conjectural drawing of the house shows that it probably had a second-story porch. From the artist, we also can get an idea of the appearance of some of the other structures in Brunswick, such as Nath Moore's front, located near the water, and the Newman Taylor House, in the vicinity of the courthouse lot. Ballast stones used for stabilizing ships with light cargoes were thrown overboard from incoming vessels and were used in constructing the foundations of many of the buildings in Brunswick. These stones were generally unnecessary to departing vessels because Brunswick products such as lumber, tar, and pitch served as ballast for the return voyage. Today, thousands of ballast stones can be seen along the water's edge where they were discarded more than two centuries ago. The archaeologist's systematic study of Brunswick has revealed thousands of artifacts that help recall important events in the town's history. Cape Fear. This is a Cypress canoe fragment. Exploring the Lower Cape Fear, Colonial Brunswick, 1725, 1731. <laughs> Ships of Port Brunswick and the routes they sailed. This place is about 15 miles south of Wilmington. He said Orton Plantation is no longer open for visitation. Some someone bought it and so it's private now. And that's what brought me down here. Black powder such as this was used to fire cannons and muskets. Spanish attack. Pottery. Plates, platters. This is a, uh, a reproduction pot based on recovered pottery fragments. Polished stone axe head, 2000 to 1000 BC, holy. There's a fish hook. No 
almost possibly used as a knife there. Got some arrow points. Arrow hands. Check this cannon out. Cannon recovered from Brunswick Town waterfront, 1960. of the port collector. This was a toilet, wow. Limestone formed from mollusk shells. Religion in Brunswick. The Stamp Act Rebellion. Tryon Palace in New Bern. Steel scissors, iron fish hooks, copper half pence, hand blown octagonal bottle. This was an oil jar. So they've got a few artifacts in here they found when they were excavating. A leather shoe. So Fort Anderson captured February 19th, 1865 by the Army of the Ohio. Egg torpedo. Oliver Powell. Here's a 53 pound spar torpedo. They had history on top of history here when they started excavating.
look at this. Holy cow. How you doing? Pretty good, and you? Okay. You got that? Oh yeah, it is in there. Wow. That's a big one. That's six pounder. Yeah. That's something else. 1680 to so circa 1720. You can close it back if you want. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. What was the years again? 1680 to about 1720. We're looking at, right now, we're looking at about 1714, 1715. Wow. But. How long does it have to stay in that? Well, it's actually, as far as the electrolysis goes, it just finished. Oh. We're just giving it a little extra time. From there, it'll be in there for about another four months. Um, we'll take, we'll take, we'll drain the tank, remove the stainless, um, clean the whole thing out. You know, wipe it down to get the sodium, as much of the sodium hydroxide off the rubber membranes we can. Uh -huh. Remove the wood blocks that it's sitting on, put new blocks in, and then start giving it fresh water baths to get all the sodium hydroxide out of it. We'll actually take it out, swing it over here on the edge of the patio, and pressure wash it. Uh, oh, wow. But it'll, and it'll then it'll soak, go, go ahead. It'll soak for about, about four more months, four to six months. And then when it's done, um, we'll drain the tank again and just let it dry on its own. Then, and while we're doing that, while we're soaking it and periodically we'll pull it out and drain the tank and all that, we'll do air scribing and sanding and everything else to get, you know, whatever's left on it off. Um, after it goes through all that and the soaking and then the drying, um, then it'll get about a, a week to two week uh, bath and tannic acid. Wow. Now turn it brown. Um, and then after that, we'll take it out, rinse it off again, put it back in there, let it dry good and dry, um, and then give it a, a coat of microcrystalline wax and it's done. And then it get displayed. Yep. And we got, we'll have a carriage made for it. So that, go inside. that's probably at least a, another year's worth of work then, huh? Close to it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's cool. I just found out about this place. Yeah, the Duplin County uh, folks were here um, in 1766 during the Stamp Act crisis that, you know, put Trine under house arrest and, you know, basically, you know, it was, it was the first, if not the first, one of the first successful armed rebellions against British authority in America. And then they would have been back here again in July 20th, 1775, after the Brunswick and New Hanover Patriots burned Fort Johnston. While they were leaving to go to a meeting, they were, they were, they were passing by the Dublin County militia that was in committee of safety that was coming to Fort wow. Johnston to support them. When they got down there, they, the fort was burned, so they burned every, what was left, which was uh, the commander's house and some of the outbuildings. Wow, that's yeah. fascinating. You know a lot about it. <laughs> hey, I appreciate it. You're welcome. Y'all have a good one. Enjoy. Yeah, thank you. All right. This is the chapel, or the remains of the chapel. John LaPierre, ordained 1707, came to America 1708, served in many churches in area 
as missionary of society for the propagation of the gospel. 1732-1755. St. Philip's Church. The bricks look like brand uh, brand new almost. History right here. I'm standing in Colonel Maurice Moore, gentleman and soldier of the king, who in the year of our Lord, 1725, founded in a wilderness the town of Brunswick. Well, I touched it. Coming around back. St. Philip's Chapel. Alfred Moore, born May 21st, 1755, died October 15th, 1810. Captain of the 1st Regiment. Captain in the 1st Regiment, Continental Line. 1775-1777, Attorney General of North Carolina, 1792-1798, Judge of the Superior Court, 1798-1799, and Justice of the U.S. Supreme Court, 1799-1804. That's quite a resume. There's his last resting place under these oak trees and Spanish moss. To the memory of Benjamin Smith, soldier and statesman. Check out this cannon. Johnny Raincloud, here's a cannon for you. This tree is pretty cool too. Beautiful tree. A view of Brunswick Town. Here's a foundation. 
of an old, old structure. Here's another one. A home at Brunswick. Hepburn Reynolds site. It's a nice breezy morning. Here on the banks of the Cape Fear River. Some stocks. I haven't seen anyone else out here this morning. Saw a deer run down that way a moment ago. These trees are awesome. These signs are a little, these signs are hard to read even being here in person. Uh, this building measures 70 feet by 18 feet. Six rooms, 10 feet wide. A hearth in the center, serving two rooms. Buttons, buckles, and beads were found here. And um, a silver spoon. That must be the hearth. a couple of these uh i guess they're wells or drainage i don't know but there's a couple of these around the property is about 10 feet down there's another one over there public square archaeology when workers first uncovered the wall around lot 27 it was believed to be a building foundation after the entire length of the east wall was cleared, they discovered that it measured 82 and a half feet. The, the exact width of a town lot. In the center of the east wall, excavators found that a portion of the wall curved to the west, creating a semicircle. The Salvier map contained a lot with a curved line at the position where the curved stone wall was found. By using this wall, and the surviving walls of St. Philip's Church, which is up at the front at the entrance. As a key, the margin of error of the Sothier map could be determined and the entire map of the town could be correlated with the located ruins. Port Brunswick. Direct access to the Atlantic Ocean was a major factor in the success of the town of Brunswick and its port. The Cape Fear River is the only major river in North Carolina which empties directly into the Atlantic Ocean. In 1731, the Port of Brunswick was established as the official port of entry for all vessels entering or leaving the Cape Fear region.
That would be Carolina Beach across the river there. Looking to the east. Looking toward the northeast. There's a dredging barge. Captain William Dry and the Spanish attack. When Maurice Moore planned Brunswick in 1725, conflict between England and Spain was imminent. There's a little breeze blowing, but it's, uh, it's warm and humid. The Leech Jobson House. The James Epsi House. Continuing on down the path. Caution, beware of wildlife. I haven't seen any signs that say you can't ride a bike in here, but uh, I don't know. There's a nice view looking south down the river. Freighter traffic coming in. Fort Anderson. One shovel full at a time. It's part of North Carolina Civil War trails. The sign says, please stay off the mound. Protected area. This is cool. Yankee catchers and infernal machines.
possible location of torpedo bomb proof. Well, this place is worth a visit, but maybe in a little cooler weather in the spring or the fall. But it's very picturesque with a nice view of the river. The Battle of Fort Anderson, 17 February, 1865. The fiberglass covers are a little shot here. The Battle of Fort Anderson, the second day. On the morning of February 18th, at least they were in the winter fighting. And the Battle of Fort Anderson, the third and final day, about 1 a.m. on the 19th. The big guns of Fort Anderson. Fort Anderson contained two main batteries that could mount 10 seacoast guns. Battery A is parallel to the river channel. Its 32 pounder guns could fire directly into ships trying to sail up the river. Battery B could defend against both land and naval assault. The fort's nine smooth bore 32 pounders had a maximum effective range of 1,922 yards, or just over a mile. The two rifled cannons had a slightly longer range and better accuracy. The Confederate Ordnance Manual of 1863 stated that a solid shot from a 32 pounder could penetrate 26 inches of oak at 1,000 yards and 12 inches at 2,000 yards. Here's a cannon for you, Johnny Raincloud. Johnny Raincloud is a friend of mine. His nickname, and he loves cannons. Coming around to the end of this trail, there's the visitor center over there. Looking back, there's a cannon. the back of the visitor center and way over there is the chapel St. Philip's Chapel there's another foundation 